sieve is this mass transfer regarding uh, this practical uh, this purpose of the objective what is the fundamental objective to separate one component from another now if i have two components which has got the difference in their boiling points right or the volatility like benzene and toluene benzene you know it has got a boiling point around 18 or 80 degree whereas the toluene's boiling point is around 110 degree so if we are asked to separate we know from our school level understanding of physical chemistry that immediately we will apply distillation maybe a batch distillation it may be a continuous distillation whatever so distillation we will discuss in detail so fundamentally we will try distillation if it has got a wide difference of solubility right like something carbon dioxide is dissolved in in a gaseous stream that is here so from there we can actually use this absorption and to recover the carbon dioxide from the solvent which is in the liquid phase we use stripping okay so that's not the point if my feed is the liquid phase and that there are two components two components means we are actually simplifying the real life problem into two uh, specific pseudo components may be like in petroleum in petroleum we have a multi component mixture and the different petroleum products are actually multi component products like you may think of petrol you may think of diesel so these are product of this distillation column and again they are um, basically multi component whereas feedstock is multi component but if i try to simplify for the basic theoretical understanding we will consider a binary system so for every binary system in the liquid feed we will first try distillation however there are certain issues because here we are using the difference in their boiling point right and what is the difference of the boiling point how far they are from each other right from thermodynamics we know that there is something called relative volatility which is a measure of the separability of the component through distillation so relative volatility alpha ab we can define as ya by xa divided by yb by xb where a is more volatile right now for feasible distillation or for distillation to be technically feasible we must have alpha ab much much greater than 1 right now if alpha ab is less than 1.2 so the first point to probe in right next if one of the component is heat sensitive what we will do if one of the component is heat sensitive we cannot separate it to vaporization so you have to think otherwise third if it is 
a dilute solution where distillation is heavily energy intensive right so primarily three cases we will think that when the relative volatility is less than 1.2 if one of the component is heat sensitive and if it is a dilute solution where the distillation is heavily energy intensive that means you have to go for a high energy budget which may not be techno economically feasible right So, under this situation, we go for one of the feasible option is liquid liquid extraction. or LLX. What does it mean? What is the process actually? You have a feed, right? And the feed there is a solute and definitely there will be a carrier just like any other mass exchange process. Now you will choose a solvent, right? Based on the chemical characteristics of that solute such that the solute has got a high miscibility in that solvent whereas the carrier is either immiscible preferably it should be immiscible and if miscible it, it should be sparingly miscible or partially miscible right. So, you add that solvent in the stream of A and B and mix it thoroughly. So, what will happen once it is mixed so, there will be mass exchanged and a liquid liquid dispersion will be generated. Why it is a dispersion? Because we have already mentioned that the carrier and the solvent which is the utility in that system, the third component we are adding in that system and that is to be continuously regenerated and recirculated back. So, the solvent whenever we are adding and the solvent and carrier being partially miscible or preferably immiscible, they will definitely form two different liquid phases, right. And the liquid phases we will churn in each other to generate huge mass transfer area in the form of liquid droplet dispersed in another continuous liquid. And what will happen? The solute will again redistribute itself from the feed phase to the solvent rich phase and will attain an equilibrium if enough residence time is allowed. As a consequence we will have we will have two different phases when it separates out right when we stop this mixing process or when we simply switch off the starter right. So, it will settle down into or it will separate out into two phases. The one will be rich in solvent where we have an appreciable amount of solute transported to that phase and this is called the extract phase. And the carrier rich phase containing the residual amount of solute may be a bit of solvent because it the solvent carrier may be partially miscible and that is called the raffinate phase. Now, the extract phase from that extract phase we have to separate the solute because we want the solute in pure form. So, what we will do? We can use another distillation column, a distillation column where keeping in mind that the solvent and the solute originally present in the feed they have got a high separability and for them for that specific uh, mixture the alpha is pretty high. Or we can use another extraction process or alternatively we can use evaporation or crystallization anything ok. So, from there we will regenerate the solvent and additionally from the raffinate phase there will be another mass exchanger 
which will separate the carrier from the residual amount of solvent plus a bit of solute definitely they will be solute and this solvent will be circulated back again mixing it with the ex this uh, extract phase distillation or extract phase mass exchanger we will mix them back and recirculate the solvent again to that uh, extraction column right. So, extraction column or extraction device is not a single one it should be coupled with two other devices right at least there will be one device why because think you may have cases where your carrier as well as the solute both are valuable ok both are valuable. So, what we have to do then? So, there the carrier is to be cleaned up from the solute and the solvent what we have added. So, that is called the raffinate cleanup column ok. But most essentially we have to regenerate the solvent and free the solute from the solvent and generate the pure solute which was our original objective. So, this distillation column or extraction column or evaporator or crystallizer which will treat the extract phase is mandatory. Additionally, you can use this raffinate cleanup column if necessary in cases where the carrier itself has got economic value right. You cannot directly discard it or even if you want to discard it you have to free it from the residual solvent and solute. So, this is the overall extraction process. So, schematic of overall extraction process. So, you see the feed here is A and C right. So, this is the extraction block or extraction equipment. New add solvent which is B plus there may be some amount of A present here. Now, from this extract from this uh, extraction column you have extract phase. which is B plus C plus some amount of A because this A and B A is a carrier let me write A carrier B solvent C solute right. So, from there you are feeding it to another column. Right, it may be distillation, it may be re extraction, it may be evaporator, it may be crystallizer, where we generate the solute A and here solvent. B plus a bit of carrier A. Now, another stream is raffinate which is A plus C plus little amount of B. So, this you feed to something called raffinate cleanup column. distillation or stripping right. So, you generate B plus A and that we feed recirculate back to the extraction column adding makeup solvent. And here from we will discard the carrier stream 
a spent carrier. Right? So that's the overall scheme of this extraction process. And you see that regarding the economy, this extraction equipment simply maximally costs 20 percent of the total capital investment. So the rest goes here and here. Okay. So this extraction equipment hardly 20 percent of needs, hardly 20 percent of the total capital investment. So, you see, uh, this is the process of extraction. Let's give an example. A small scale but very important example. Extraction of penicillin from fermentation broth. You see that there is a property we have to explore. At pH about 2, it is soluble, the penicillin is a solid, it is soluble in organic phase. Whereas for pH about 7.4, it is soluble in aqueous phase. Right. Now, the concentration of the penicillin in original aqueous fermentation broth is pretty small, and that we have to concentrate before we feed it to the crystallizer. So, here fermentation broth. We may use uh, from the fermentation broth, we may use a centrifuge to separate the microorganisms debris, right, and get the clear fermentation broth. So, technically, what is the accepted process? Here we have to feed it to extraction extraction unit 1 right and we add sulfuric acid to change its pH so it operates at pH nearly 2 and there we add the solvent. What is a solvent? Then organic phase and preferably amyl acetate. Right. So amyl acetate we add. So from this aqueous phase, the penicillin heavily is uh, distributing itself between two phases and attaining equilibrium. And as it is highly soluble in amyl solvent, major penicillin goes to this uh, organic phase. Now, the organic phase that is the extract phase, we feed to extraction unit or extraction unit Two, where we add buffer at pH 8, right. So, it will change this pH to nearly 7.4 and again it will come to that the penicillin will now in a concentrated form will come to the aqueous phase. So, the amyl acetate is regenerated 
So, the extract we will recirculate back and we will feed this, uh, this sorry not the, this, uh, this is the raffinate from unit 2 and extract to crystallizer. And here this definite phase we simply discard as spent raffinate. So, that is the overall process it is a two stage extraction process ok. Now, you see what we are doing in the first unit we are operating in, in acidic pH high acidic pH which is pH 2 and we change this pH of the fermentation broth upon adding sulfuric acid. So, once we are adding sulfuric acid and changing it to pH 2, the penicillin now has got high solubility in organic phase. So, we add the organic phase and that is the solvent which is amyl acetate or butyl acetate that is ester we are adding in the extraction unit 1. So, definitely most of the penicillin like 99 percent will be transported to this or will be just changing their phase from this aqueous to organic. So, aqueous phase which was originally the fermentation broth and after that we have added the acid will simply discard. So, this is the raffinate phase of unit 1. Now, the extract phase which is the solvent rich phase that is amyl acetate rich phase will be fed to that extraction unit 2 right. Now, in the extraction unit 2 see the feed is organic phase plus penicillin and we are adding an aqueous buffer at a high pH such that the overall mixed state pH will be around pH 7, 7 or here it will be around 7 I think. So, it is 7 right, it is nearly alkaline. So, in this extraction unit the solvent is the buffer itself at pH 8, whereas the feed is this amyl acetate plus penicillin. So, here this penicillin again as it has got high solubility at pH 8, pH 7 in aqueous phase. So, it will switch to aqueous phase and that will be highly concentrated we are feeding it to the crystallizer. And the raffinate that is the solvent used in the extraction unit 1 which is re being regenerated because here the feed the extract phase from the unit 1 was feed to the unit 2 right. So, the raffinate from the unit 2 which must be the nearly pure amyl acetate will be recirculated back in the extraction unit 1 upon adding makeup solvent. So, this is the overall process of penicillin extraction. So, similarly we have the caprolactam, we have this organic, this aromatic removal from the different petroleum feedstocks like lube oil right. From the lube oil we have to remove this benzene, toluene, xylene in order to improve the viscosity index of this lube oil. So, there we use this solvent like uh, nowadays we use NMP, N-methyl pyrolidone or previously it was furfural, this liquid sulfur dioxide etc. right. So, that was also used but nowadays we mostly concentrate on NMP this N-methyl pyrolidone or this MEK methyl ethyl ketone. So, these are being used to remove this aromatics that is benzene, toluene and xylene from lube oil and from this uh, even the lighter fraction feedstocks like kerosene. From the kerosene we have to remove the aromatics otherwise it will produce suits right. When it is burning it will produce suits. So, that is why we have to remove this <coughs> aromatics from kerosene as well as from the lube oil feedstock because the presence of aromatic will reduce the viscosity index. So, because of that there it is an another example of removing or, or aromatics from these different petroleum feedstocks by using the solvents like furfural or NMP and methyl pyrolidone. So, with this basic introduction let us now move to the detailed technicality of liquid liquid extraction process. So, you see this uh, 
liquid liquid extraction first we will discuss about the process and next we will go for different equipments right <coughs> now when we go for describing the process through our, our we try to calculate some number of stages and all which is very common in all mass transfers mass transfer operations so there if i try to calculate the number of stages or determine the what is the amount of the solvent required so we have to determine the number of stages and the amount of solvent required so we have to perform calculation creating a suitable phase space where we can describe that but the problem here we have three components at least three components right one is the carrier another is the solute and another is the solvent so three components which makes the representation bit difficult relative to what we have done in absorption in stripping or in humidification and cooling tower calculations so we have to think of a space where we can represent the three components composition so we will do that but before that let's understand that what are the different types of ternary systems so in the baseline it will be a ternary system right a plus b plus c a is the carrier b is the solvent and c is the solute so the first one is immiscible carrier and solvent right so the carrier and solvent are immiscible so this is highly preferable however we may not find this sort of solvent which is perfectly immiscible with the carrier so we have to go for limited miscible cases partially miscible but here immiscible carrier and solvent but solute is miscible completely in both right so partially miscible carrier and solvent with solute completely miscible in both right so this is called type 1 ternary system the first one is immiscible the second one is type 1 ternary first one is not exactly a ternary system actually right because as they are immiscible so what will happen you will have two binary solutions binary liquid solution containing one is a and c another is b and c so this is purely the ternary system next partially miscible carrier and solvent additionally solute is also partially miscible with the solvent solute carrier solute and carrier are completely miscible
So this is called type 2 ternary system. That's rare in process industry, but there are different cases where we can have this type 2 ternary systems. So with that understanding, next question is how to represent the composition of three components, right? How to represent the composition of A, B and C in a two dimensional phase space. So here we introduce triangular diagram. First it is the when it was introduced it was equilateral triangle. What is the reason? See we have got three components right. So in an equilateral triangle what is the property? You just try to understand. This is uh, A, this is B, this is C. Now, if I have any points and if I draw, say P, perpendicular on the three sides, let us say this is H1, this is H2, and this is H3, and equilateral triangles, uh, this. <coughs> height or median height is H. So, we know for equilateral triangle H is equal to H1 plus H2 plus H3. So, if I now introduce a scale that H is 100 percent, right, H is 100 percent then the sum must be equal to 100 percent, right? So, if I am stating that H is 100 percent, so actually alternatively I am stating that each vertic vertex of this equilateral triangle actually represents the pure component, 100 percent of A or 100 percent of B or 100 percent of C. So, <clears throat> let us now think. This is C 100 percent, right? So, the opposite line AB, this line AB represents 0 percent C. Now, if this vertex represents 100 percent B, then this line AC represents 0 percent B. And if this A represents 100 percent of A, then the line BC represents 0 percent A, correct? So, the vertices, there are three different uh, notions, right? The vertices of a triangular diagram must represent the pure component A, B and C. The sides represents a binary system like AB represents different proportions or diff solutions having different mole mass fractions of A and B only, but there is no C. AC represents the same with A and C, but 0 percent B and simply BC represents 0 percent A, but B and C only. So, any point in the intermediate inside this triangle, it is a ternary system, right? It is a pure ternary system. There are three components, all the three components are present. And what will be the mass fractions of that individual components? Definitely this height, right? So, if I apply that height from here, this height, say the point is here, this height will be C, this height will be A, and this height will be B. So, instead of going by simply writing the height, let us put the grid lines of different percentages, right? Like this is 100 percent, this is 0 percent. So, this must be 10 percent, then 20 percent, 
थर्टी परसेंट फोर्टी परसेंट फिफ्टी परसेंट सिक्सटी सेवेंटी एट्टी नाइन्टी एंड हंड्रेड दे नॉट इक्वीज बेस्ट सो सिमिलरली सो दिस इज ग्रेडेशन ऑफ सी सो दिस लाइन दिस इज टेन परसेंट दिस लाइन रिप्रेजेंट टेन परसेंट बी ट्वेंटी परसेंट बी थर्टी परसेंट बी फोर्टी परसेंट बी फिफ्टी परसेंट बी सिक्सटी परसेंट बी सेवेंटी एट्टी नाइन्टी एंड हंड्रेड सो सिमिलरली दिस इज टेन परसेंट ए ट्वेंटी परसेंट ए थर्टी परसेंट ए फोर्टी परसेंट ए फिफ्टी परसेंट ए सिक्सटी सेवेंटी एटी नाइन्टी एंड इट इज हंड्रेड राइट ना यू सी द डिफाइ रिप्रेजेंट द पॉइंट हियर राइट एंड आस्क यू what percentage or what is the composition of the solution which is being represented by the point here so you count so this is 10 20 30 40 50 so it is on the 50% of c line right so 50% c now for b it is 10 20 30 so 30% b so definitely it must be 20% a so let's check what is the a so a is 10 and 20 so it's falling on this 20% line right so similarly anything we can represent any point inside this space inside the triangle represents a ternary system the sides you see the sides it's 0% c so if i if i have a point here right if i have a point here this is 100% b okay so this is 10% 20% 30% b and on this side this is 70 80 90 so 70% a right and vertices are pure that is 100% a b and c so one of the way of representing this ternary system we have discussed it it's a triangular diagram so in this triangular diagram now we have to represent the ternary system and as i have mentioned that in extraction what do we have initially the speed a plus c we are adding b plus a bit of a because it is being regenerated whatever right and next we get a mixture which separates out into two phases mostly if i add uh the correct amount of b or if a b c they have got this corresponding property that when b is mixed with a and c it will separate out into two phases one is a and c plus a bit of b and another is b and c plus a and they are in equilibrium right so this equilibrium curve we have to plot okay so <clears throat> how to represent it in the equilateral triangular diagram c a and b right now think that i have taken uh some amount of a and b right and in that we are adding varied amount of c and we are stirring it okay so we'll generate different equilibrium system where the c in raffinate and c in extract they are in equilibrium with each other same for b and a okay so if i mark those points we will get 
two phases one is rich rich in a that it will be close to this point a and another point will be rich in b because the respective this solution is rich in b right so that is rich in b so it will be closer to this r this vertex b so a point may be here which is in equilibrium with a composition of ternary system here so and if i join these two by a line this is inevitably becoming the tie line right so we'll get similar other tie lines Now you can see the tie lines, the length of the tie line as we go on increasing the amount of C is decreasing and finally it will meet at a point, it will be reducing into a point, though that point cannot be experimentally generated, but it can be approached. So if I join them, this extract side composition and raffinate side composition and extend this. I will get this sort of curve, right? Where the tie lines meet at a, this equilibrium, the two arms of this equilibrium curve, they meet at a point that is called plate point, right? So this is the raffinate arm, and this is the extract arm. and they meet at plate point. So you see this gives you a dome like structure and that curve is called overall curve is called bimodal solubility curve right because it has got two arms and that is why we call it bimodal okay and these are the tie lines. Now the point is if I have any mixture here, it is an unstable mixture as we have discussed in thermodynamics also that the respective Gibbs energy of the mixing will be non-convex, right? So it will split into two phases. So it will split into two phases and if I draw a tentative tie line, the respective composition of the phases will be represented by this, right? So it will split into two phases. So inside this dome, we have every solution, every ternary solution will split into two phases, whereas outside it is a miscible regime. It will not split and so there will be no separation. So we have to add the solvent, right, in such a way so that the mixture's composition, the feed and the solvent, say feed is a pure A and C, so it will be somewhere here. And let's say we are adding pure solvent, so it is somewhere here. So the mixture's composition of the feed and the solvent must be lying right along the connecting line of this F and B like this. So say I have added huge amount of solvent, so it will be a point here, so there will be no separation. Or if I have added very less amount of solvent, it will be a point here, again there will be no separation because it is in the miscible regime. But if I add an appreciable amount or correct amount of solvent, such that it is somewhere between this intersection and point this intersection. So it will now split into two phases and they will be giving relative separation. Why relative separation? Because 
from this structure and the tie lines are never horizontal they will be either inclined in this right hand side or inclined on the left hand side so here what we get here this is the extract phase composition yc right and this is the raffinate phase composition xc let's say yc or y represents the y extract phase composition and x that is a raffinate phase composition right so y and x are different and we achieve a separation so that's the idea of y modal solubility curve tie lines and the separation via extraction the physical basis of separation what we have discussed uh, with this equil equilateral triangular diagram we can also use right angle triangular diagram in addition to this equilateral one because it is consistent with the structure of cartesian coordinate space right you see right angle triangular diagram so this is the two arms must be equal this and this right this is c this is a and this is p so along this axis we represent yc or xc and here along this uh, we simply write xb or yb that is for component b this vertex has got no significance it's not actually representing a so if i have the now here we can also draw the tie lines because we have the extract phase and the raffinate phase so we can measure the xb and xc additionally yb and yc the extract phase composition is y raffinate is x so here a point will be this yc comma yb here another point this is xc comma xb right so this is the tie line so similar other tie lines will be like this so we join them and we get the plate points over here right and you see we can convert it to this yx coordinate equilibrium space like if i draw this uh, coordinate space like yc and xc then there is a 45 degree line so you see this is y c this is xc so xc we have here yc we have here so the point is this and the plate point is here right so if you go on drawing the tie line mapping the tie line in the yc xc space and if i simply draw the equilibrium curve it will be this sort of uh, curve it's not like the typical equilibrium curve what we observe in distillation 
there is a hump because the plat point is not at the point of maxima it will be either on the left or on the right ok. Now next comes to the point of solvent selection. So just like we have introduced this idea of or we, we are going to introduce just I have in thermodynamics also we know we have studied mass transfer they also we have got this idea just uh, uh, this uh, some uh, sometimes previously we have defined what is relative volatility and the condition for feasibility of distillation is that the alpha must be greater than much greater than 1. So, here what is the solvent selection is based on the fact that we introduce a new term very similar to alpha and that we call selectivity. Hmm. High selectivity. beta much greater than 1 where beta is equal to what y c by x c divided by y a by x a that is a selectivity ok. So, y c they extract to raffinate of c ok divided by y a by x a. So, basically this can also be written as y c by y c by x c into x a by y a ok. Now, this ratio of the mass fraction of C in extract and in raffinate phase it is called the partition coefficient. So, this we can write as K into X A by Y A. Now, the second one high selectivity the second is definitely we should go for high value of K right, but even if k is less than 1, but beta is much greater than 1 still we can carry on distillation as a feasible process. The partition coefficient must be high, however for k less than 1 and beta much greater than 1 LLX still remains still remains a feasible technique still remains as a feasible separation technique. Right. <clears throat> now, in this relation, uh, we must discuss a bit of liquid liquid equilibrium in order to understand this uh, relation of the selectivity and partition coefficient to the different thermodynamic properties. Right. See liquid liquid LLE right equilibrium just we are in thermodynamics we have studied vapor liquid here in extraction it is necessary to understand the liquid liquid equilibrium. See the fugacity of a component species in alpha phase let us say there are two phases only one is alpha phase another is beta phase ok. Here the composition is represented as x i superscript alpha this is x i, x I superscript beta right. So, f i cap alpha must be is equal to f i cap beta the component species fugacity 
or the two components or, or the any component in the two phases must be same. So, here it is gamma i alpha x i alpha into f i naught is equal to gamma i beta into x i sorry into x i beta into f i naught. So, considering simple solution this f i naught f i naught the standard state properties will cancel out and we have x i gamma i alpha into x i alpha is equal to gamma i beta into x i beta right. Now, for two components only we have only two components. So, for a binary system there is two component system we have the relation gamma 1 alpha x 1 alpha is equal to or rather uh, let us not go by binary we can directly write uh, this partition coefficients expression rather here from directly from here ok. So, x i alpha or x i uh, beta divided by x i alpha x i beta by x i alpha is equal to gamma i alpha by gamma i beta. So, for ternary system what you can write? We can write that y c by x c y c corresponds to this uh, extract phase x c corresponds to that of raffinate phase for component c is equal to gamma c extract uh, sorry gamma c raffinate divided by gamma c extract and these gamma c raffinate are functions of different x i and temperature whereas this one extract is functions of extract phase composition and temperature right. So, for binary ternary systems we can write the expressions provided we have used the correct model of activity coefficient or excess Gibbs energy. So, partition coefficient our second point is that this quantity that is a partition coefficient Kc must be high right the desirably it should be high, but even if it is less than 1 still we can carry on extraction provided we have a selectivity much greater than 1. So, that is the second condition of solvent selection right because we have to choose the solvent such that the partition coefficient right of the solute in the solvent phase solvent rich phase and the relative to that of raffinate rich phase or this carrier rich phase that is a raffinate is preferably very high. Next it is immiscibility of carrier and solvent. You see I will explain this with a diagram. Think that we have two we have used two triangular diagram here we are considering miscible system partially miscible system. and this is immiscible right. So, partially miscible system the bimodal solubility curve will be like this and for immiscible system the bimodal solubility curve will be like this. So, this is C A and B and this is C A and B. Now, let us say a solvent is pure solvent this 
here also it is a pure solvent. Okay. Now for the pure solvent, if I draw a tangent from this point of solvent to this curve, I will get a line like this. So you see, if the feed composition is up to this point, we can actually treat it via extraction. How? Because if the feed compost feed is extremely highly reaching C itself here. Now if I join it to B, we will have the mixtures composition here it is miscible. So it will not separate out into two phases, so it cannot be uh, actually the solute we cannot separate upon or using LLX. However, if the feed is here, then the mixture composition will be here and it will split into phases with different composition. So, if the, if the solvent and the carrier, they are partially miscible, there exists a threshold value of the feed composition above which it is not treatable upon using this liquid-liquid extraction. Whereas, if it is immiscible, you see, you draw the tangent, what you, which one is the tangent? It will be this. So, all feed we can treat by LNX, right. So, that is the necessity of immiscibility between the carrier and solvent. And additionally, if the carrier and solvent are immiscible, right, so there is, we, do, we have to simply treat the, or we have to simply separate out the solute from the solvent in this uh, extraction column, this, sorry, the extract, this uh, extract phase column, okay, after extraction, the extract phase will be fed to another mass exchanger which may be I have mentioned that re-extraction, distillation, it may be crystallized or it may be evaporated. And the raffinate that is also a binary system, it will only con consist of A, the carrier and the solute C and the extract will consist of B and C, so it is much easily treatable. So next is interfacial tension. What should be the choice of the solvent such that and, and uh, what is my desirable interfacial tension between the two immiscible phases, right. One is carrier rich, another is solvent rich. So what will be the intermediate tension and based on that we should select the solvent. So thing is that if I have a high interfacial tension, a lot of energy is needed to disperse one liquid into another because interfacial tension is a measure of energy, minimum energy that is necessary to create unit area at the interface. So, if I have got a high interfacial tension, huge amount of energy is necessary, right. So, this is a disadvantage. And on the other hand, if I have low interfacial tension, very low amount of energy is necessary and we will think that okay, it is good, but actually not. Because the dispersed phase or dispersed liquid liquid dispersion you have to again separate out into two phases and when from the mixer you are feeding it to the separator or the settler what will happen huge residence time is necessary and that is why the size of the settler will be huge ok. <coughs> so considering this view interfacial tension must be <coughs> optimum right. Definitely from economic perspective. For the correct choice of the solvent. Okay. Now next, the solvent is also important, 
and solute must be easily separable next solvent viscosity must be low must be low right to save the pumping cost and finally there are common criteria like non toxic cheap non inflammable etc so these are the conditions of uh, these are the issues we have to keep in mind when we are selecting the solvent so primary the criteria is selectivity partition coefficient immiscibility and interfacial tension right so based on these four uh, <coughs> conditions and rather three selectivity partition coefficient and immiscibility this we should majorly focus the rest of the qualities we may compromise hmm. if it is economically permitted so with that basic understanding let's now move forward to this process calculation for single stage extraction <clears throat> and the typical equipment will consider here for understanding the process because this will give this not definitely the equipment what we universally use actually we don't use it much for industrial purposes we use it for small scale purposes and the device is called mixer settler right it consists of a vertical tank fitted with an agitator where we are mixing this feed with a solvent that's the mixer and next the mixed liquid liquid dispersion is fed to a settler where enough residence time is allowed and such that it will equilibrate and it will separate out into two phases right so single stage single stage extraction process right so what is the device we have a mixer fitted with a high speed impeller so here we give the feed a and c flow rate f mass fraction of c is z f and we add solvent definitely it is regenerated solvent flow rate s mass fraction of c it's y s so from the mixer we get liquid liquid dispersion right so overall its flow rate m and mass fraction of c it is xm right and that we feed to the settler which is a horizontal vessel definitely there will be a baffle and it separates out afterwards in two phases so this is the extract phase so i'm not writing the same this is the flow rate is x and the mass fraction is y of c 
and the raffinate phase. The floret is R and mass fraction is X. So we will assume there is an equilibrium calculation, equilibrium assumption for outgoing extract and raffinate phases. Right. So that's the overall structure. So we have to solve for this E, Y, R and X, etc. And we know that S, Y, C, F, Z, F, these are known. So <coughs> overall material balance is F plus S is equal to M is equal to E plus R, right. And component balance results F Z F plus S Y S is equal to M X M is equal to E Y plus R X. So, number of variables in this system, you see uh, M, X, M, E, R, Y, X, so 6, M, X, M, E, R, Y and X, there are 6 variables. So number of equations is 4, this, 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 this 2 equations, similarly here 2 and 2, 4 equations. So degrees of freedom is 6 minus 4 equal to 2. So you have to know or we have to get the values of two variables, right. So here we choose y and x to be solved from triangular diagram. Now you see that if I consider the equation up to the mixture like this. So there are two equations only and two unknowns, right, unknowns m, x, m, two equations. So we can solve m and x, m. Right. So once we know XM, we will use here the triangular diagram. To do what? So in the triangular diagram, we will draw the bimodal solubility curve. This is A, sorry, this is C, this is A, this is B. Knowing ZF, knowing the feed composition, and feed is a mixture of A and C, so it must be lying on this line AC will locate the point F, right, will also locate the point of the solvent here as S, will connect this line and knowing XM will locate the point M because XM is the say it is 28 percent, 30 percent, something like that. So this must be, this is 100, this is 100, we have a grids here. So this will be around uh, this uh, 28, right. So this is M. And how we have constructed the bimodal solubility curve? Because in the baseline we have the equilibrium data. So you have drawn the tie lines like this. Like this. So now we have to draw a tie line through this point M, right. So by trial we can draw a tie line having a slope which is average of these two adjacent tie line slope but there are more accurate processes. What is that? So question here is that how to draw because if I do not draw the tie line 
I will not get this will be y and this will be x, right? This will be x. Where the tie line intersects the Raffinet term, the vertical is x which is the which is needed there and this is y. So once we know y and x we can solve but how to draw the exact tie lines passing through the point m as we do not have any tie line right in the original equilibrium curve. So question reduces to how to draw the tie line through the point m right. So here we have to use the concept of conjugate line what is that see I am drawing it separately because otherwise it will be too clumsy here sorry. So, we have the tie lines given in the original equilibrium data. Let us say there are 3 tie lines. So, with these tie lines considering the tie line as hypotenuse we will draw the and there is a plate point. So, we will draw the right angle triangle right considering this tie line to be the hypotenuse like this ok. So, <clears throat> now through this right angle triangles 90 degree and plate point we will connect this smoothly and we will get the conjugate line. So, once we have the conjugate line next say I have located the point m right I have located the point m from this f and s I have located the point m. Now, what I will do I will go for by trial I will go for drawing a tie line and we will check whether if I draw a right angle triangle with that specific tie line what I have drawn the right angle triangles 90 degree vertex whether it is lying on the conjugate line or not. So, by changing the slope a bit right we will go on adjusting it such that the respective right angle triangles 90 degree falls on this conjugate line ok. So, that is the way of doing a construction of the tie lines through this point M which is the composition of the mixture and that we have obtained from this material balance first two overall and component material balance and from there we will get y and x we will now substitute y and x because the degrees of freedom is 2. So, we will substitute y and x and we will solve for. So, using y and x we will solve for E and R. Okay.